I don't normally stop Hello, Dan. <laughs> <Am I laughs> How's that? How's that for a beginning? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, the couch is back into its normal spot. I'm feeling Jack's good. At back at top. Jack's back atop the couch. It's, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the nominal rise on which the, cu- the couch normally sits. The nominal bump on this floor. Um, Dan just gave me a tea. I'm pretty sure it was caffeinated. No. No, but no way. I'll be up all <laughs> night if it was. Um, uh, so I know we always say this every week. I did not think the weather could get worse, <laughs> and yet it has. It's been hovering at or around freezing, but still not cold enough for it to snow. So it's still raining and it's just really cold, and it really sucks. Uh, <laughs> Whereas in other parts of the country, they're actually getting snow, uh, and it's beautiful, and it's great. Down here... Um, you just want whatever you've not got. Exactly. Yeah. When it gets hot in the summer, I'll it be It was like, apocalyptically Ugh. cold on New Year's Eve, wasn't it? Yes. Very, very cold. It was very cold. I mean, like, by, by standards, <laughs> by British standards. Obviously, if you hail from anywhere where it's I mean, actually here's, cold. Here's the thing. If it's actually cold in those places where it's, like, snowing and below freezing, that's different than the, like, just getting your bones wet, almost freezing now, cold here. I've, I've been told that <laughs> by, by, peop- uh, by people who come from some of these places <laughs> where it is actually legitimately cold in uh, winter. Some of these freaks. That... The cold here, to some extent, is worse than the cold there, and mm. they have chalked it mm. up to how moist, how moist, is that the right how word? Moist. humid. It's a, it makes sense. How it's humid gross. it is. <laughs> <laughs> like the humidity combined with the cold, yeah, kind of like cuts through you in a way. Supposedly, anyway. I agree. Somebody's gonna have to. I, mean, <laughs> I agree. I mean, I'm from somebody, a place somebody, where it's not somebody, cold. somebody, let us know whether that's <laughs> legitimate or not. We obviously, did have one listener Obviously, from we're not living in Siberia or <laughs> yeah. any other part of Arctic tundra. Mm. Um, mm. So, yeah, we're talking like minus one, minus two centigrade. Oh. Pretty cold. Pretty, Pretty cold. What's that in Fahrenheit? Uh, it's like 36, 35, okay. 34. Okay. For our uh, American transatlantic listeners. Yes, for our transatlantic listeners. Um, yeah, it's cold. Uh, not much else there. Uh, not other than the whole global pandemic and the world falling apart. Not much going on, I'll say. I feel like other than that enormous history-breaking catastrophic event, uh, not a lot going on. No. I don't know no. if that's just because the news cycle's being dominated and because <laughs> I barely like look at the news, quite frankly, or just that everything's kind of coming to a standstill, but it's like, I don't know how much is going on. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. I'm not paying attention. Uh, uh, it's a new year. It is a new year. Mm-hmm. Although Happy supposedly year. last week it was a yeah, new year, yeah. but this is the real new the year. The real new year. Happy new year. Any resolutions? Um, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> it's another I year. Sh- I, I, shared on, I, I shared something on Facebook that Jack had been had shared, which was a list of Woody Guthrie's <laughs> New Year's resolutions oh, cool. from like, I don't know, uh. 30, 40, so it was during the first, the second world war. So okay. one of them was like, defeat fascism. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we did it. Yeah. Nice. One of them was dance better. <laughs> Those are two pretty <laughs> different resolutions. <laughs> Jesus. Is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I might try and dance better. Uh, dance better, dance more, or dance less? Uh, better but less. Quality over quantity. I mean, I feel like I'm not going to force dance into my life, <laughs> but okay. it would be nice if there were more opportunities than has been presented by the last year. I see, I see, In I see. the forthcoming year. Uh, uh, and uh, mm. dance, dancing better. I just, yeah. Sure. I mean, it, it takes practice, I suppose. There you go. Or maybe it, it just is. takes... Gumption. Go- yeah, that's a great <laughs> word. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I just need to more gumption. Yeah, more gumption. In my dance. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. I, too, would also like to defeat fascism. Uh-huh. Um, don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but I'll put it on the list. Uh-huh. I'll put it somewhere uh-huh. below the bottom, uh-huh. quite frankly. But yeah, I'll put it on my list. Uh-huh. I've kind of, I, I like... I think I've given up on resolutions. They're usually just like... <laughs> I don't think I've ever made Maybe I just... Like... Yeah, I, I was developing the habit of making sort of like almost quite grand proclamations. <laughs> like something along the lines of like sorting one's life out. <laughs> okay, yeah. And that, oh, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Number one, sort life out. Number yeah. two, defeat fascism. <laughs> <laughs> um, which obviously inevitably fail, right? Yes. Um, 
And also, I do feel like this is entirely the wrong time of year to be like yes. changing one's life. Yeah. Like, let's just let's just make it through January. Let's there we just, go. Yeah. Okay, I want to make it to February. January, yeah. That's my resolution. I would like to not get COVID. Yeah. That's a yeah. unless I've already had it. Yeah. In which case, don't give it to me again. But I would like to not get it. Mm. Do you think, as an immigrant, I was wondering this today, if they offer the vaccine eventually to like everybody, do you think, as an immigrant, I would be allowed to get it? Because I don't think so. Even though I pay the NHS thing, or I paid it. I don't know. Uh, I mean, they're not going to get round to us anytime soon. It's true. It's very true. And I mean, I suppose if everybody gets it but you, you're probably safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll be a little hurt. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But Maybe I would... They want you to get it, Joey. Uh, it's true. Yeah, yeah. It's true. I think... Yeah. I, I kind of want to start like a like a big thing where like I get it, but then like someone else like who's like more risky doesn't get it and then it's like a whole thing in like the daily mirror where it's like immigrant gets covid vaccine before uh-huh. little old lady <laughs> oh i see i thought you were talking about covid <laughs> oh. no you want the vaccine <laughs> yes exactly yeah <laughs> immigrant gets COVID. In- immigrant steals covid <laughs> yeah. Harpers, yeah, um the first okay. night yeah. i was ever in this country i was really jet lagged i showed up at night so i didn't get a chance to see what anything looked like and I couldn't sleep and it was like two in the morning and I was really hungry because I hadn't eaten on the plane and then I just didn't eat. And when I couldn't sleep, I was like, okay, I, I need to eat something so I can like try and fall asleep. So I'm going to go find something that's open. And the only thing that was open was like this like kind of chippy kind of thing, right? And I go down there and there are a bunch of drunk youths uh, in front of the window. And one of them sees me trying to pay with like my like coins and i didn't know what the coins were yet so i was trying to figure them out and this one dude says oh look at the immigrant trying to figure out the money and i was just like oh my god is what this country is he read you straight away he read me straight away i was like jeez <laughs> been here like two isn't hours that, isn't that what they warn you about in all the guidebooks like, yeah uh, yeah one. stay away from british people yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stay away from chip shops at two o'clock in the morning. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The CIA handbook, travel <laughs> handbook, or whatever it's like. Don't go to chippies at two in the morning in England. Yeah. Um, serious risk. Yeah, serious risk mm-hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a rite of passage. It is. And I had my mind blown the first time I went to a chippy, and they're like, do you want salt and vinegar on, on your French fries? Okay. And... I was like, excuse me? Uh-huh. You want uh-huh. to put vinegar on my french fries? Were you buying chip chips or were you buying like... I was buying chip chips. I was yeah, buying yeah. chip no, chips. No, I don't mind. Yeah, I don't mind which terminology you mean. <laughs> it's for but sometimes like, it depends. If you've gone into like a sure. like a kebab shop, they're probably sure. just giving you something analogous to french fries kind of thing. Oh, but they probably still so offer you salt and vinegar. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. If you, ha- if you got french fries mm. in America, uh-huh. would you be expecting to be offered... Salt and vinegar, and would no. you think it would? Yeah, but do you think it would? It would. It wouldn't lack. It wouldn't lack from. You wouldn't. I mean, feel they, a sense of lo- loss. They would. <laughs> no, they would put salt on it without asking. Of course, you. it's already. And then if you in, ask for vinegar, they'd, they'd be, be like, like what, what, "What the fuck?" <laughs> you'd be like, "What'd you just say?" And anyway, eventually, okay. I tried it, and I'll tell you what, folks, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Do you get salt? Do you get vinegar on your chips? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I don't know why. Yeah, I should try it without. I mean, nah. yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I got mushy peas relatively recently for the first time. Mm. It was exactly what I expected. It was just mushed peas, um, okay. which was fine. Okay. There's not much else I can eat at chippies or that I'd like to eat, so. Yeah, I don't know how I would describe mushy peas. Just, mush, just it, mushy you think, peas. You think that's the best definition? It's yeah. like creamed corn. It's like, what does creamed corn taste and feel like? Yeah, but like creamed corn. I have no idea what creamed corn is. Yeah, that is a dis- actual distinctly disgusting American thing. It's uh-huh. the corn equivalent of mushy peas. Okay. <laughs> Very bad. Uh-huh. Very, very uh-huh. bad. Do I want it? Or is it no, you don't want it. It's horrible. Okay. Consistency of vomit, and it's very sweet. And it's like, I don't know what people do with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm generally suspicious of, like, <laughs> corn anyway. <laughs> I don't know why. Do you like popcorn? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Yeah, why not? Yeah. I mean, I don't eat it very often, but, like, sure. it's not for lack of... Maybe that's a news resolution. Liking. I love popcorn, and I eat it, like, twice a year. Oh. Maybe I'd like to eat some more popcorn. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Popcorn's good. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I also never watch movies, and I never really watch TV. Maybe it should be to watch more of those two things. Watch more movies and TV. Yeah, I always thought of you as a movie person, but actually I think what yeah, I realized is you've actually seen relatively few <laughs> kinda, movies. Yeah, kind of <laughs> not. Um, I did, two nights ago, or maybe three nights ago, whenever, watch um, the Star Trek Next Generation episode where the Enterprise keeps blowing up. Damage report! Kestrel reports are coming in from all over the ship! 
Starboard nacelle has sustained a direct impact. This is the bridge. All hands to emergency escape pod. Ejection systems are offline. Core breach is imminent. All hands abandon ship. Repeat. All hands abandon ship. That's nice. hands down the best episode, dude. It's so good. Oh my god, it's I, I, love, a, I, I love a good time loop episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, any any show. I know. Time yeah, loops. time loops. Yeah, because I'd forgotten. I hadn't seen I that one in a while, one. and I was like, oh, I wonder how they're gonna save the ship in this opening sequence, and it blows up, and the credits happen, and it's like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> good effect. I remember too. watching that one as a kid. I mean, distinctly mm. remember watching that one as a kid. Mm. You mentioned. Uh, Measure of a Man the other day, and yeah. so I went and watched that. Isn't that becoming a race? And won't we be judged by how we treat that race? Now tell me, Commander, what is Data? I don't understand. What is he? A machine. Is he? Are you sure? Yes. You see, he's met two of your three criteria for sentience, so what if he meets the third? Consciousness in even the smallest degree. What is he then? I don't know. Do you? A few days ago. Classic. So, Classic. now I'll go and watch that one. That's what's making just, me not just, be able... Uh, just bring, bring me an uh, uh, yeah. Next Generation recommendation <laughs> yeah. every time I see you. And... Once a week, we'll replace the broad beans. Next Generation yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll episode. Do a, we'll do a Next Generation <laughs> recap. That's what's making me not want to watch Picard, even though I should. And I don't have the... Uh, it's not available to me. But isn't the whole premise of that, like, androids are now illegal or something like that? Sure, yeah, yeah, And the whole point of Measure of a Man is that they can't be property, and then it's like, oh, no, now they're property. Hmm. Such is my understanding. Right. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Bruce Maddox is in that, is in Picard. You know, the guy who's, who wants to... Really? Yeah, Does he, he play the same character? Data. I don't know whether it's the same actor. Oh, because I, okay. I couldn't remember. I, it's a lot when I watched when I watched Picard. It was a long time since I'd seen that Star Trek episode, so I didn't actually remember his face. So it gotcha. may or may be not be the same actor. Gotcha. Um, but it's the guy who wanted Data's brain. It's the guy who wanted Data's oh, brain. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I wanted to download Data's brain and then <laughs> take him apart. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of like, yeah, the, the yeah, the, I guess the, the premise is that um, uh, there was an attack on Mars. Orchestrated by, or supposedly orchestrated by, androids, androids, mm. and therefore they've subsequently outlawed androids and other mm. artificial intelligences. I suppose mm. um, seems like an overreaction, but but I think <laughs> it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they did destroy. I mean, that federation distinctly more reactive, I th- reactionary rather than <laughs> than the one that we're familiar the with. The utopian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Androids. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just. I wish, I wish they'd get over. I, I wish like contemporary culture would. I think it's already happening. Would like get over this fear of AIs. I don't know anything about AIs, mm. so I can't mm. tell you whether they're a legitimate danger or not. I just I like don't no. want them in my sci-fi. Like, <laughs> you don't, or you don't? No, no, I don't. Oh, you don't. I mean, they can be in the sci-fi, but I want them. I want them to fulfill a more interesting purpose than yeah. the uh, AI wants to kill us all. But d- so data is good. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I, it, I saw Nemesis in theaters when I was a kid, and it, me and my brother were like, oh, my God. Spoiler alert for Star Trek Nemesis came out like <laughs> 2015 years ago. I mean, don't watch it. Or whatever. I mean, it's really quite a poor film. Don't watch it. But it has Tom Hardy in it, which is weird. It does he's, have Tom he's, Hardy he does not look like Tom Hardy. Anyway. He, he also doesn't look like Picard. <laughs> he does not look anything like Picard, which is classic. young Picard, right? The, yeah, yeah, they yeah. just shave his head. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Um, spoiler alert for that movie Data dies at the end uh-huh. and I remember just me and my brother were just floored it was yeah, just like yeah, whoa yeah. Yeah. yeah wild we were like Data's dead it was a, yeah yeah. My, my mom took me and my brother and because my dad was just like I'm not going to see that and then we came <laughs> back we came back and we were like Data's dead my dad was just like ah, whatever and we were like ah! <laughs> I think I was saved that trauma. I didn't see that movie when it came out. Mm. I mean, I'd have been a bit older than you, but I probably mm. still would have been traumatized. It's um, traumatizing. It's sad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Does he mm. come back in? Anyway, he comes back in Picard. I think, yeah, right. Yeah. To some ex- yeah, I think so. Because he's fat. I've seen the screenshot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can like CGI like mm. you can fix the face a bit, but mm. like. Mm. Mm. Thick yeah. data. I mean, it was problematic. <laughs> because like all the way like even even in even in Nemesis like uh, obviously whatever he's called I've forgotten his Picard? name the actor. Data? No, the oh actor, Brent Spiner Brent Spiner uh-huh. yeah doesn't look 
Oh. He did it too, the way he did in 1987 <laughs> <laughs> And then now in like 2020. Yeah, yeah. 2021, yeah, yeah. even. Yeah. I wrote the date for the first time today. Mm. When did, why did I do it? Oh, for the notes for this show. I wrote 121 as the date. Nice. I am... Um, I am... Um, write the date quite frequently but never i've just a few years ago i just just like yeah. I'm, um i always get the year wrong i'm just not <laughs> going to put the year i mean obviously if it's something that actually needs the year writing sure. down on it but i so i so rarely like would you put the date like sign a check or yeah. a, some kind of like uh, official document know. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, it, if 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 not if it's if it's just from anyway yeah. <laughs> day month i mean like if it's from last year or from previous years mm. i really doesn't matter mm. Yeah, but I mean, you do you. I will but do just consi- you. just consider the possibility that like it's more of a faff. It is trying to remember what year it is, and you could just cut that. Faff you want out. me to blow your mind when I write the dates for the show? I only do month and year because I don't care what day I did it. So oh, I just right. want to know generally <laughs> about where was I? Sure, when I was okay, doing this. okay, okay. Yeah. You're, big, you're a big picture guy. I'm a big picture big guy. Picture I'm a month guy. kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Have you adopted um, British dating yet? No, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> Even at work when I... I mean, like... essentially, British really is global. I mean, it's just... It's just all right. It's just... All right. <laughs> okay. Wow. Is that true? I actually don't know. I'm pretty sure. I would be willing to disagree, but only because I'm not sure. Okay. I feel like more uh, yeah, countries... Uh, yeah, not knowing is good grounds <laughs> yeah, to, 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 on which to disagree. <laughs> I've never thought I about that. that. I, support I just, that. I guess I just kind of tied it in with... I know. I, I'm inside that, but I'm going to. I would like to take that whole thing Good. back. Actually, <laughs> like, like, yeah. It's 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 one of it's one of those things which, um, it almost feels chauvinistic. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to get into any sort of e- even performative like petty. Yes. Good. One nation is doing something better than some other nation. I appreciate you, that. You write. You write your dates Thank however you, you like. Thank you if so you want to write star dates, I'd be incredibly <laughs> impressed. <laughs> Um, excellent fodder for a transition, Dan. <laughs> because today, speaking we're, of Star Trek, <laughs> we're talking more Star Trek. No, today, Dan, we're getting back into the good stuff. We're talking Ralph Miliband. We're back, part four of our Miliband series. Oh, Introduction one it. six. This one, yes. Um, and we did it. Dan and I have been having some discussions about the structure of the show. And I believe kind of what we're thinking is that we're going to continue to do what we're going to do, but we're thinking about having like one explicitly Marxist text, kind of a longer text, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, that we are going to be working on in the background over multiple episodes, this being the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think whether it's um, an, a, a, a we're committed to a good idea or whether it's a concession to a failing of ours yeah. that we can't read anything particularly quickly. Although, mm. I mean... We're we're introducing ourselves to ideas. Yeah, we really ought to take our time. Exactly. There are some good books, however short, which um, yeah. If we mill them over properly, yeah. we can sort of like yeah absorb the ideas in a way which makes them actually useful to us, as opposed <laughs> to like charging through things and uh, absolutely sort of like losing money. Around. Yeah. So we're thinking. We're thinking we know what our next one's going to be. You'll see, because there was still quite a ways. We just passed <laughs> the halfway point with this. this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are two more chapters. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And we'll I, get... don't, I don't want to, like... I mean, if we were desperate, we could just be like, right, the next two episodes are... <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't really want it. It would look, it would look weird. It would look bad yeah, it would for look our bad. fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes. So, this week's episode, we are finishing <laughs> chapter... Jesus, this is numbered so strangely. Hang on, I gotta scroll back. Why don't we are finishing chapter four, the defense of the old order two, uh-huh. starting at section two, <laughs> ending in section three, five. four, and five. <laughs> <laughs> so finishing chapter four is basically what we're doing, um, and this one is a continuation of what we talked about last time, which neither of Dan or I bothered to see what we talked about last time, but we believe it was all about the state and about the state as an organ of class. And about kind of picking apart those ideas, I believe. And yeah, that, I mean, this, yeah, struggle. this chapter in particular, this section is more explicitly about elaborating a Marxist theory of class or the basic elements of a Marxist theory of class. Mm. Um, the preceding chapter was some to do with that as well, but a more generalized um, uh, how is it that uh, capitalist society has forestalled, prevented yeah. revolution through cultural means. Now yeah. we're more into sort of like um, 
the state apparatus and how that um, upholds capitalist mm. society. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so this time, this week around, we'll be talking all about Miliband's views of... Uh, he does a couple different things in this chapter, and he kind of goes all over the place, and the last bit is a little bit dated, but he begins by talking about the differences between different class uh, governments and class states, right? Um, so he kind of first off says that it's an ultra-left distinction, right, of the Marxist left. Oh, this is an ultra-left thing to say. A deviation. A deviation, <laughs> indeed. That um, uh, uh, all forms of class society are capitalist and thus because they share this, the same idea of a class society because there is class in these societies then they're all the same thing so he says that that's insane that's crazy you can't lump together fascism authoritarianism and um like modern bourgeois republics right um and it's interesting i mean this is the classic miliband approach right like he's taking something that you might have heard at like your marx your marxist friend at the dsa quote unquote saying like it's yeah dude it's just all the same thing and giving you that like 30s common turn line right yeah uh, yeah miliband's general approach is a yes but exactly or, or yes yeah. and kind yeah. of thing it's not to deny that like um there are similarities. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, well, I mean, he, he certainly supports the Marxist notion that all states are class states. Yeah. Um, all states function to uphold a certain class relationship. They they allow for the exploitation of one class by another. Yeah. Um. But that being said, that that sort of Marxist premise, hold, being true and hold continuing to hold. Mm. That doesn't mean that all states are the same, and there exactly. is a di there's a differentiation between the states in different modes of production. There is a kind of like there's a feudal state and a sort of uh, um, the states of antiquity and slave states and the like, mm. um, and those sort of like arrangements functioned in a way which was complementary to the modes of exploitation or the forms of exploitation that allowed those different modes of production to function. Mm. Um, but also, there is not just one capitalist state. The state functions in various different ways. So once you accept that it's um, it's it, it serves to uphold a class relationship, you can have various different actual or quite a lot of nuance in um, what states are. Exactly. Um, yeah. And the I mean the basic distinction that he draws here, uh, with some adaptation, is a distinction between. Um, a more republican democratic state and a more authoritarian one yeah um, and it's a distinction that um, can be taken from Marx's political writings because um, uh, Marx obviously wrote a huge amount about um, the political developments in France during his time Miliband suggests that like uh uh politics in France was Marx's sort of great laboratory for state theory sure um or sort of political theory to some extent mm. um the failures of the second republic and then the 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 subsequent sort of uh, period of bonapartism which was like a new empire sort of authoritarian mm. dictator dictatorial empire to mm. some extent mm. um and how those how those developments and changes um functioned in relation to the development of capitalism or how they complemented uh, the class relationships in France at the time, Absolutely. and those two categories. Well, there's, there's a, there are other categories. But the, yeah, there's the you. I think Marx uh, and Miliband, in reference to Marx, talks about democratic republicanism mm. or the republican democracy as one category, and then the whole sort of series of um, authoritarian versions, Bonapartism in Fra uh, France. That's correct, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and then also um, uh, the Bismarckian state. Yeah. In Germany, yeah, at a similar-ish time kind of thing, yeah. and then obviously they have their sort of parallels in the 20th century in uh, bourgeois democracy, as opposed to various forms of authoritarianism, fascism in Italy, and German Nazism, mm. um, as two as, as sort of the 20th century analogs to those two sort of broad categories, yeah. authoritarian and democratic forms of state. 
Yeah, mentioned. exactly. And he does make the point, right, that these are all, like exactly what you're saying, these are all class states. These are all societies that run on uh, subordination of different people, more or less arbitrarily, right? Because that's how class works. It's just, it's a system where there's private control of uh, production, distribution, um, et cetera, and an exchange. And um, his main point though, is that again, yes, but of course that's, that's what these states are, but you can't lump them all together as the same thing because that's gonna completely mess up your strategy as it did in the 1930s, right? Yes, when the common turn had a line that was like, all capitalist states are the same thing. They're all whack, they're all our enemies. Which again, yeah, but but that led to disastrous effects because it it didn't obviously it wasn't like the main thing that led to the rise of Nazism, but it certainly didn't help stop it, right? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, um, yeah. It, the, the the I think I think I mean uh, I don't sufficiently I don't know sufficiently enough about the history, but I suppose or suspect the theory is that um, had the Third International had a much more explicitly anti-Nazi, yeah. Uh, position one which was willing to support the democratic structures of weimar germany mm. um sort of uh weimar germany might have survived into the 30s and not been replaced with fascism yeah um something i would but but, 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 if, but the but the but the but the sort of like the communist the third international the communist international the common turn sure um took this position which was like they're all bourgeois states. We're not going to differentiate or distinguish between um, German so German democracy or German mm. fascism. Yeah, um, we're going to put, oppose the two equally. Yeah, and it wasn't until until like thirty five or something that they made this change where mm. um, the the Comintern adopted a um, uh, almost a National Front <laughs> popular oh. front <laughs> position <laughs> of. Um, a united front rather position of mm. um uniting with social democracy and other nominally bourgeois forces to uh, oppose fascism mm. i mean that had its own issues and problems sure of course um, but as you say uh by st sticking to this rigid uh view that um all bourgeois states are alike and should be treated equally can lead to catastrophic tactical decisions. Catastrophic yeah. decisions, yeah. And I mean, yeah, a lot of this does reek of what I'm going to call academic Marxism, uh -huh. which is stupid uh -huh. to say. But it's like, it's this idea of like, well, they're all the same thing, uh -huh. dude. And I it's mean, like, I imagine have... being a normal person living in Nazi Germany yeah, and then yeah, seeing yeah. what society like yeah, is yeah, in yeah. England. It's like, yeah, England sucks, but it's not fucking yeah, Nazi yeah, Germany. Yeah. I can, I can, I have to admit that there is a certain appeal to the kind of belligerence. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, get rid of it all. Yeah, but yeah that's the point. Um, but you have to be strategic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it could continue to be a sort of like left communist position that it's pretty anarchist. Sort of hold to that line kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, sad, I'll say. So I'll, I'll hit you with a quote, Dan. He says, as noted earlier, it was the same trend of thought which led to the adoption, or at least served as a justification for the adoption of the class against class common turn policies of the third period, in which all bourgeois regimes of whatever kind were assimilated for strategic purposes under the same rubric, with results that materially co contributed to the Nazi conquest of power in Germany. There are, of course, many different reasons why this assimilation was easily accepted by the overwhelming majority of members of communist parties and organizations. One general reason, as I also already noted earlier, has to do with an attitude of mind to which Marxists have been prone. This is the belief that because A and B are not totally different, they are not really different at all. This error has not only been made in relation to the state, but in other contexts as well with damaging effects. More specifically, there is a permanent Marxist temptation to devalue the distinction between bourgeois democratic regimes and authoritarian ones from the view that the former are class regimes of a more or less repressive kind, which is entirely legitimate. It has always been fairly easy for Marxists to move in the inaccurate and dangerous view that what separates them from truly authoritarian regimes is of no great account or at least not qualitatively significant. The temptation to blur the distinction has been further enhanced by the fear that to do so otherwise would make more difficult an intransigent critique 
of the class limitations and inherent shortcomings of bourgeois democracy and of the fear that it would conceal the fact that bourgeois democracy can be turned with the assent and indeed encouragement of ruling classes into authoritarian or fascist regimes. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's pretty much exactly what we're saying, right? Um, it's the idea that it also seems my barbaric understanding of what dialectics <laughs> is seems to be entirely if you're going to call yourself a marxist that just seems to be this idea of what he says because a and b are not totally different they're not they're basically the same thing yeah. right that just seems to go against entirely against the grain <laughs> of what marx was trying to do with his theory of history uh -huh, uh -huh. called crazy sounds like a basic failure of logic that we yeah heard about last week <laughs> yeah yeah um i wonder how much of that had to do with just like hey maybe we could get half of poland <laughs> you know, yeah, it's strategic. Yeah, there you go. Shame, not very good strategy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it, I mean, you, you raise an interesting point, sort of side point. That's like so many of these sort of like uh, strategic or tactical um, d decisions that seem to be theoretical are often based on sort of like um, some other. Yeah, there is there is some other motivation. Quite often, these things come down to what are the foreign policy goals of the soviet union yeah <laughs> yeah a lot of the time like, yeah. that seems to be the sort of driving um the driving motivation for what come to be taken as sort of like theoretical tactical decisions kind of thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah um, of course i mean as the standard barrier standard bearer of 20th century and i guess just communism period right that's kind of the burden that they have to bear of like yeah, yeah. Oh, look at what the communists did. It's like, well, look what the Soviet Union did, you know. But anyway, that leads us into kind of the next bit that he talks about, which is this distinction between authoritarian and fascist and bourgeois uh, democracies or republics. Um, and what does he say? Yeah, I mean, he basically just says that, uh, you know, even though there's this element of class in them and the whole goal of Marxism, communism, socialism is an end to class society, this is a book about politics, right? And in politics, you have to be bit more strategic so he goes into the differences um he makes some interesting points would you make of all that um i suppose there's two that come to mind first is the um the sort of t the, the tactical choice the degree to which you support and then engage with um bourgeois democracy mm. or the sort of democratic republic kind of thing mm. um marx and engels in their various writings had differing took different positions at different times but it sort of had this general um sense that uh bourgeois democracy is all bad or at least um you should be very suspicious of uh the institutions of uh the states sure the cats the, the capital the state kind of thing um they in their time um there's a there's a portion of this where he's talking quite a lot about the sort of tactical distinction between or the distinction between uh reform and revolution or uh more generally perhaps whether the uh the the ultimate strategy or the sort of like the tactic that's being uh, pursued and driven at is either one which pegs all of your hopes for a transition to socialism on uh, a revolutionary overthrow of the current situation, the current state, mm. or whether um, there is a, uh, a democratic transition possible. Yeah. Um, now, Marx and Engels are quite sort of like uh, tactical and strategic in this. It, it doesn't. It's not a basic premise for them that uh, revolution and only revolution is the the road to socialism. Yeah. Um, it's more a question of. Uh, what is the best tactic for the given circumstances in any particular state? Um, so Marx and Engels approach like uh, Britain and America, and there's a mm. quote where he says, if I knew more about Holland, I'd probably lump <laughs> Holland in as well, but I don't know enough about it kind of thing, um, where they had quite established uh, democratic systems, and if, if full or... Um, uh, or at least universal male suffrage hadn't been instituted yet. It seemed like a l likely outcome, mm. uh, and therefore the question then becomes like, well, can if you can build an electoral majority um, for you your socialist party, mm. um, that that's certainly not something to be 
not tried not pursued quite yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, whereas if you look at somewhere like germany in the 20 in the 19th century or russia say yeah like the the possibilities for developing a socialist movement out in the open free of state repression with access to with full access to democracy none of those things were in place right so you have to take a much more sort of like uh underground and revolutionary position yeah um now as we develop into the tw- into the early period of the 20th century with the overwhelming and sort of quite st- staggering success of uh, german social democracy after the end of the uh, bismarck period there was a period of time where the german state tried to suppress communism mm. um, and socialism and um, those policies were defeated and therefore the German workers' movement could sort of move out into the open in the latter part of the 19th century and then into the 20th century became a sort of like really established social force. Um, it almost did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that so the question, the, there was a sort of general tactical shift in uh, Marxism, not so much in Marx because he'd already died to some extent, Engels, uh, nominally endorsed this transition before mm. his death um and then as you move into the 20th century um the 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 plausibility and the possibility of a sort of democratic road to uh socialism or at least um participation in democratic elections and having some kind of relate relationship to the state and some amount of legitimacy um were seen as part of the overall strategy yeah so it's not necessarily um full adoption of um reformism but your sort of like um engagement with uh state apparatuses or how you organize your own uh working class movements aren't necessarily underground revolutionary ones so it's possible for you to operate out in the open to yeah. some extent yeah um I can't I remember say, what your original question was or even what you section we're talking about. You make excellent <laughs> points. I have no idea either, but you make I excellent points. I think I claim to have two points and I can't remember what the other one was. Um, <laughs> well, you're, you're let remind. me just add on you're, to your you point. You shall remind me, <laughs> Let me just add on to your point and say that if we take a look at who, speaking of strategy, if we take a look at who partnered with the proto-fascist Freikorps in the German Revolution to put down the Soviets in uh-huh. Bavaria, uh-huh. Uh-huh. I wonder who that was. Yeah, yeah. It was the Social Democrats. Yeah, yeah, so when yeah, we yeah. talk about partnering with bourgeois parties, hey, to a certain yeah. extent, where's yeah, it going to yeah, get yeah. you? That's yeah, it was the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's widely known, but it was the right-wing leadership of the Social Democratic Party that um, betrayed Rosa Luxemburg. Let's say that a little bit louder for people <laughs> who maybe don't know what happened. What Dan is saying is that there there was a revolution in Germany at the end of World War I rightfully so because they got screwed over the you know what was the worst war of all time up to that point right this imperialist war yeah, yeah, yeah. where at the end of it and i again another, another 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 i don't necessarily know the, the history particularly well but i think it is certainly true to say that it's the german workers movement which ended world war one yes um yes i mean people were not about overthrowing to the kaiser right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 get his ass to the netherlands wherever he went to holland wherever it was um and then there was a revolution and things looked good, but the soldiers who weren't very happy and who turned fascist needed some political support to basically go murder all of the communists who were setting up uh, what was going to be a very different Bavaria to the one we have now. Uh-huh. Um, uh, like I said, the proto-fascists uh, partnered with the right wing of the uh, socialist movement, social democrats, yeah. and uh, proceeded become... to literally just go and murder all of the communists, including yeah. Rosa Luxemburg, yeah, yeah, yeah. and just... Which, not good. Yeah. Not good folks. So, the Social Democrats allied with what would become the Fry Corps. Exactly. Uh, to put down, or to at least sort of like kill certain influential figures in yeah. German communist And movement. there were massacres. There were certainly yeah, massacres. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, still a little upset about that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you very much, Germany. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, this is what happens. It, this it, is it, what it, happens. But, I mean, that is the question, right? Like... Um, but what kind of party do you end up building exactly. if you if you adopt this kind of like big tent yeah. strategy? The big tent, the DSA big tent. Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a fine line, right, between building that party and having what Miliband in earlier chapters calls that catechismal orthodoxy of defining exactly what you have to be about, kind of like gatekeeping 
for your party, I mm -hmm. guess, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, how do you build a movement that is explicitly for the people and has the people's aims in mind that doesn't peter out into social democracy? Um, FDR style, baby. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's the big question. Mm -hmm. But um, in, in this chapter, he does kind of expand a little bit more on the question of reform versus revolution in a way that I think was kind of eye-opening for me. Because we can say all of this about social democrats and stuff, but at the end of the day, um, re reforms are extremely important and they should be something that should be pursued, quite frankly. Sure, because yeah. what else are you going to do? Wait yeah. for a party to come around? You know what I mean? Like, obviously you should be doing that too, but I mean, I don't know. He, he makes the point, though, that even though reforms are, you know, they save lives, et cetera, et cetera, um, they are pursued by people in power who know exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it. So I'm just a really short quote. He says, power holders inside the state system have been well aware of their responsibility and acted upon that awareness, not because they were opposed to capitalism, but because they wanted to maintain power. Uh, I think I have another little one here. Oh, no, I don't. Never mind. Um, but he makes another caveat to this, which is that when the state pursues reforms to kind of like keep the rabble from going crazy, um, that is opposed by other members of the ruling class. So there's there's schisms there as well. And this is all to build to the bigger point that um, Miliband makes the point that in bourgeois republics like we have now, um, nominal democracies, there is more uh, chance for class struggle than in any other form uh, that we have seen so far of class society, right? Um, and I think that's kind of the point that he was building to, right, when he was talking about the different forms of state, is that where we are now, now that we have, you know, <laughs> universal suffrage, I'm saying that in air quotes because in America we don't quite have universal suffrage yet, but um, now that we have that and other forms, like other reforms that have come along, there is a lot more opportunity for class struggle. And that's nothing to be scoffed at, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. If you're trying to build a movement. Yeah, you, I mean, you've reminded what my second point was going to be, which Excellent. is that, <laughs> um, which is this uh, to outline this broad relationship between authoritarianism and bourgeois democracy, or uh, perhaps more generally, or m with a more historic view, Marx's definite descriptions of the relationship between Bonapartism and what preceded it in France, or why the states takes on a more authoritarian role mm. is usually or oh, this transition this this or this degradation or what have you between democracy and authoritarianism happens because there is sufficient or so much or such a large amount of social strife going on um that it's just not feasible to allow um sort of liberal democracy to carry on functioning yeah. because it's really beginning to threaten um the sort of like structure of the system itself kind of thing that was certainly happening in the 20s in Germany mm. um, and also it just happened in 1848 in France mm. um, so there's this kind of like basically the, there is what is the, one of the solutions to um, a threat to the social order the sort of capitalist structure of society um, would be to enhance uh the sort of the authoritarian would it be to well but basically what he describes it is to say that you make the estate the state more autonomous in its functioning mm. you don't curtail its um its actions and you allow it to function almost sort of above society as a mm. kind of corrective uh measure kind of thing and as you alluded to like the capitalist class is also not always in favor of that transition right it's not it's not sure. it's not automatically a given that a fully or a sort of a fully autonomous state a state which is freed from the confines of sort of liberal convention a state which is not as marx would have described it like uh does it doesn't have to be responsive to other elements of civil society it doesn't necessarily mean that that authoritarian form of state is going to be beneficial to the capitalist class kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, and but as you as you pointed out, mm. nor necessarily is a democratic state kind of thing. Sure. Um, which is generally brings us back to this point, which we start, sort of touched on when we spoke about Miliband last time, mm. which was like Miliband's conviction that the state isn't purely controlled by the ruling class. 
it's an it acts on the behalf of it's a class state in that it maintains the class relationships of capitalism or mm. uh, whatever mode of production it is that it it functions in it serves over but it's not actually controlled exclusively yeah. by a class it's run for a class's interests mm. um but the, the the ruling class or the bourgeois class or the capitalist class, whatever we want to call it, doesn't have one monolithic interest. Exactly. And we've also, in other parts of this book, we've been introduced to the idea that's quite obvious, really, that like it doesn't even know its interest quite often. <laughs> yeah. Um, and will make catastrophic errors in 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 pursuing its short term goals. It's going to it can't see the bigger picture kind of thing. Mm. The way that Miliband presents the state in this book is one which is. Um, has a slightly more big picture view kind of thing, knows when to make certain con concessions uh, to the working class, say, or to certain elements of the working class, um, knows when it needs to take from the ruling class and sort of provide more social support or what have you kind of and thing. And sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, to borrow a phrase from uh, one of uh, my just all-time classic Brit, there isn't really an invisible hand, right? That's guiding the like <laughs> bastardizing that phrase a little bit, but that's like guiding the state by, by like this one dude sitting in a chair, like Matrix style, like designing society to be in the like you know image of a capitalist class. Like that's obviously just not the way it works. It's a lot more complicated than that. And what you said about um, kind of like the ruling class also having different objectives and aims reminded me a lot of our Mike Davis reading where we saw an in-depth historical analysis of what that meant when it came to Reagan and what that was a certain subset of the ruling class that wanted some prick actor to become, you know, president of the United States because they were the Sunbelt capitalists, right? And sure. the people in the Northeast were like, him? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then obviously eventually, like once he got in power, um, it was all, the dialectic was able to be resolved between the North and the South. <laughs> um, there's something else I wanted to say along those lines. I forget what it was. Mm -hmm. um, something about Mike Davis, but uh, it's out of my head. I don't know. It's out of your hands. It's out of my invisible hands. <laughs> um, there's another interesting bit where he kind of talks about, though, what, kind of to expand on that a little bit, what a capitalist class's interests would even look like and how that would organize itself as a state. So he says, capitalist development and expansion has meant, in effect, the development of particular national capitalisms with their respective national states seeking to advance capitalist interests. Obviously, this does not mean that the people in charge of state power necessarily acted with the conscious purpose of serving those interests. What they were doing, in their own view, was to serve the quote-unquote national interest, fulfilling their country's manifest destiny, spreading civilization and Christianity, serving queen or emperor or whatever. But none of these aims, they also thought, was incompatible with the advancement of national business interests. On the contrary, the advancement of these interests and their defense against other national interests protected by their own states was generally felt by power holders to be congruent and even synonymous with whatever other purposes they had in mind. So again, it isn't just this big, when you read like left theory, sometimes you can have like a bong rip take that is like, whoa, dude, like someone's just controlling it all from the top. And it's like, no, it's, that's absolutely not what's going on. There are constant ca contradictions in the ruling class. Um, but I think that that also is very, like, makes our task a lot less daunting, I think. Um, because it's like, oh, it isn't just one monolithic thing that we have to overcome that's impossible to overcome. It's mm -hmm. like, these people are running around with their heads chopped off. They have no idea what they're <laughs> doing. Like, look at America. Look at England. Nobody knows what they're doing. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I don't know. It's yeah, wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, what? What you described there is a whole certain, a whole set of like different uh, ideologies which might drive at a certain goal, yeah. uh, but those ideas, ideologies don't necessarily acknowledge um, the goal of advancing and a particular state's sort of like uh, the strength of a particular state's economy or capitalism as being mm. its ultimate aim, kind of thing. But mm. um, but they do feed into that, um, and so as you say, like it's not like there is some kind of like economic chess architect. player or architect <laughs> or what have you like you know, orchestrating the whole arrangement kind of thing. Mm. Um, and on one hand, that's kind of obvious, right? Because it's like, if these interests weren't compatible, then they wouldn't have worked so well together. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. kind of like, duh. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. once you understand that, 
does lead to a little bit of a throwback to last week's episode, Paradigm Shift, because it is like, oh, well, wait a minute. These people come and go, not because, like, their ideas fall out of favor or something like that. It's, it's just kind of like, I don't know. There, it's just more information than we can process almost. You know yeah, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah maybe we're, we, we should be inclined to think of the state as being a kind of, like, corrective of the capitalist system kind of thing mm. like there are it's not like um it's, it's not like it has some kind of like that sort of logical mind guiding its decisions but there are things which sort of like pull the shit back on course to some extent yeah it was like a, yeah there's your invisible hand <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly um mm. all this kind of yeah, yeah I don't know. I, it reminds me of like a, it's a similar thing with cops right in america where as tempting as it might be to just think that every single cop is just some racist pig, m moronic uh, protector of private property, and that's all they exist to do, right? You kind of have to think of cops as not existing to protect private property, not existing to, like, promote racial subjugation through terror, although they do do that explicitly quite a bit. You have to kind of think of something like that, of like a repressive apparatus of the state like that as... Something that sees itself kind of like as a protector of a given way of doing things. And they're not explicitly going out there being like, you know, stop loitering. I'm here to protect the, you know, don't graffiti on this Walmart or something like that because they're trying to protect private property. They're there to just protect what they see as their role in the society, right? Which is like these macho punisher tattooed, you know, flat topped toothless <laughs> moronic syphilitic fools <laughs> to put it simply <laughs> i don't know where i'm going with that it was just another excuse to use the word syphilitic yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't escape my notice <laughs> <laughs> that is the second time i believe i've used the word syphilitic possibly third but i think second time on this show um, i much prefer this application <laughs> yeah i can imagine yeah i apologize again for my last use of that word um any anything else to say about uh, fascism before we move on? Bourgeois um, republics. Well, we'll circle back to it. We'll circle back if anything comes into my head. Anything to say about cops? Uh, no. Okay. No, no, no. I mean, it's an interesting. It's an interesting. I was think. I was thinking. I thought you were going somewhere slightly different with the metaphor to some extent, which is mm. like a. Um, it doesn't really matter what's going on in the individual minds of the individual cops, sure. but there's this kind of like systemic logic that takes over kind of thing well that's that's the tragedy of the whole thing is that when it comes to cops it does matter it absolutely big, matters big, yeah, 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 <laughs> what's going on in their mind they'll <laughs> sure, just kill yeah. people sure yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it's not a good metaphor mm. yeah police officers um <laughs> okay going. so the next bit that he talks about uh miliband our good friend polish is he polish i'm not sure i, I want to say hungarian hungarian Miliband? We should know this. Ralph? Now. <laughs> he how can't dare, be How can we call him a friend of the show? Okay, I'll pause the show. i got to look it up. <laughs> I need to go to the toilet. Okay. <laughs> if I told Communism. you his, if I told you his name know. was, his original name was Adolfe, Adolf, possibly just Adolf Miliband, uh -huh. would that help you guess where he was from? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It might incline me to say Austrian. <laughs> um, Poland. He's Polish. Polish. Is yes. that what you said? That's what you said? Yeah, that's what right. I said, yeah. But I, I was like, I don't you know. You were right, I was wrong. Hungarian, please. Um, so before we move on to the last bit of the chapter, which is all about uh, actually existing communism, um, I suppose we should talk a little bit about nationalism. Because he brings it up a bit, and he talks about this question of should Marxists, communists, whatever, support various national liberation movements, say Poland mm -hmm. against Russia and mm -hmm. Germany, say... Uh, what would become Czechoslovakia, later Czech Republic, now Czechia for some reason, over... Um, it's branding. You know, it's branding. <laughs> yeah. I check. Um, <laughs> Maybe they just don't want to be a republic. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, should we support these things? And, I mean, the bigger question there would be, like, sh obviously there's, like, imperial nationalist struggles, et cetera, et cetera. But the question that he's kind of posing here isn't so much uh, colonial independence struggles. It's more so, like, should we support like tiny European countries becoming their own countries. Uh, you know, maybe he would bring up now it would like Kosovo against Serbia, something like that, right? Or like maybe like Western Sahara mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and he kind of brings up two points, right? He brings up the Bolshevik point and then brings up the Luxembourg point. 
where the Bolshevik point eventually kind of became, as yeah, I suppose we should support these countries because that's kind of like a first step to getting socialism. Luxembourg, it's a little more complicated than this, but she kind of said, no, because it's all bourgeois. The nation is just like fake news, which I'm kind of inclined to, but I understand both sides. What do you think? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a um, piece of communist history, I suppose. Mm. Um, it seems like very much of a tactical question. Yeah, I mean, sure. in the cases of both uh, Lenin's position and Rosen Luxemburg's position, it was a sort of this sort of like a, a question of tactic to some extent. As you say, like Rosa Luxemburg, very reluctant to endorse uh, nationalism, even though she, I mean, she was Polish and yeah. Poland was currently part of like oh. the German Empire, right? Mm. Um, very reluctant to endorse it for a very good reason that like um, it's so much easier, so much more easily married with um, sort of bourgeois aspiration or nationalist aspiration of the mm. of the state kind of thing. Obviously, the Soviet Union much more interested in it. They were in a huge empire, and so many of the, the people involved in uh, in um, the the Russian Social Democratic Party or Russian Social Democracy, the various parties therein, mm. um, were from various sort of subject nations of that empire. Mm. Um, and also, it was quite a good way to sow discord in various areas of the Russian Empire. Was to say, yeah, we're pro your uh, sort of right mm. to self determination, right to secede from um, from the uh, czar, from, from the czar, from the empire. Blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, Miliband mm. makes the point that uh, as the course of events played out, uh, maybe not, maybe the Luxembourg position isn't like universally correct. Mm. Uh, but in in this instance, like um, it it played very played to their disadvantage, kind of thing. Um, so much so that they really had to change their position later on. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, he he quotes Stalin as basically make uh, suggesting that like um, it's self determination not for the nation but for the working classes of those nations. Yeah. Which leads very easily into once you have had a uh, workers' revolution of some sort or other, and you're incorporated in, into the Soviet system, kind of thing, or to you're you're incorporated into uh, Russia to some extent. Um, why do you need to make these demands for yeah. self determination anymore? Your Come working on. classes have been liberated. <laughs> like, <laughs> you did it. We're done. <laughs> and again, at the same time, like um, the Soviet Union, then. Uh, supported very much all of these liberation struggles in Africa and other parts of the, in scare quotes, third world. Mm. Um, mm. I think, I would suspect largely, I mean, maybe they could make a a, a moral justification for it, as they ought and should, and we yeah, can sure. and should. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was also a tactical decision on their part in their kind of like Cold War with the US. Yeah. How can we win? F how can we sort of dismantle the imperial powers in the West? How can we reduce the powers of the Western capitalist countries or re reduce the influence of those countries in various parts of the third world and, and also increase our own sphere of influence we can support sort of like revolutionary struggles in these places. Um, mm. Not that supporting revolutionary struggles in these places was bad in and of yeah. itself, but as I was saying before, like so many tactical decisions were also what is most advantageous to Soviet foreign policy and yeah. Soviet relationships to other countries in the world. Absolutely, so, absolutely. And let's not uh, get it twisted though, because Rosa Luxemburg wasn't someone who would have said no to all of that, right? So he does say, as for Rosa Luxemburg, she did not, of course, believe that subject people should be denied the right to in independence, but that this could only be achieved on the basis of an international socialist struggle that must not be diverted by the acceptance of such slogans as the right to self-determination. So it's like when you put it like that, it's like every socialist on the planet would agree with you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like, yeah, that isn't a substitute for what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But then there's also this idea of like, well, is the smaller nation state a better political unit to work with? Again, that's case by case. Uh, sometimes I would say yes, sometimes I would say no. Um, but again, the hardest thing to do, it seems to me, in uh, the socialist struggle is getting enough people to listen to you. And that's a good way to get people to listen to you. Like if you were to show up in 
uh, now, like, I keep, like, Kosovo again and start talking about just, like, radical left-wing politics. It wouldn't mean much. Or in, <laughs> yeah, yeah. or in, say, like, Syria or in Kurdistan, you know, it would mean a lot more if you tied that to something that people felt passionately about. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's nationalism for you. Yeah, folks. and I suppose there's a, like, I suppose we could try and expand this to the question of, like, Scottish Independence Day uh, or something like that. The Highlands. Like, he, he, <laughs> He makes the point that there's been a general antipathy to uh, secessionist struggles in various sort of like um, uh, member nations of the European the, the, of the United Kingdom. Uh, whoa, um, <laughs> damn! It's 2021. Um, I guess on the grounds that we're interested, the communist parties or uh, the workers. The representatives, the militant revolutionary representatives of the workers' movement, should there be a militant workers' movement, uh, would be looking to uh, take over a the largest possible geographic region, um, and so I, I, yeah, I suspect that's, that must be their general position, or unless it's simply that like demands for Scottish um, independence are a sort of like distraction from demands for the liberation of the working class from the sort of yoke of wage labor and the yeah. bourgeoisie kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um from Westminster. But uh, but as as a, but as a, but uh, uh, the demand as the sort of the movement for Scottish independence um is such a live issue, it's such a powerful position um it isn't particularly strategically advantageous to go to those people and say like um yeah. Fight for the revolution, not for your independence kind of thing. Exactly. Um so I guess there's a tactical question of like how do you interact with these things? I mean, yeah. when I come to, when it comes to Scottish independence, when there was the referendum in twenty fourteen, I was just a bit like just break up the break up the UK, <laughs> like it's this sort of like just that it, simpler that it would do injury to exactly, this institution yeah. Yeah. Um, seemed good enough in and of itself. And also the people on the other side, it was kind of like... You know, yeah, you don't really want to be lumped in with these people. Yeah, these freaks. Um, but I guess there is also... We, we are led into this sort of broad question of like, what would or should an ethical position toward this look like? Yeah. Like, is there a case... But clearly, if there is a a democratic demand, which is... Uh, demonstrated in some kind of um, irrefutable democratic declaration kind of thing, i.e. there's a majority in a referendum for independence in Scotland or some yeah. other nation. <laughs> I mean, at that point, you've got to uh, sort of like support it, right? Like, yeah. Um, I, I suspect on, on at least like if, if you have any claims to be any kind of a Democrat, I suppose you have to... Um, Listen to the people. those aspirations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's also like a matter of riding coattails too, to a certain extent. Could you use that to be like, you know what, the UK does suck, and it sucks because of X, Y, and Z. So let's have a better healthcare service. Let's do everything in a much better way. Let's be a country on the hill, so yeah. to speak, a shining beacon of democracy and freedom, um, which is what you would hope it would be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There is another um, portion of the the section on uh, nationalism, which is all kind of about, um, to some extent, why are there still states? Why is it still <laughs> the the significant unit? Mm. Why has that unit been so significant to the development of capitalism? Why does it continue to be uh, the privileged uh, sort of way that we break up society and sort of like break yeah. the world rather and think about relationships between groups of peoples um he makes the point that like uh, states in a lot of ways and we saw in the middle in in reading Ellen Mixon's word like states are incredibly influential in actually developing capitalism in certain countries yeah um countries develop in nascent a I almost said asymptomatic <laughs> asymmetrical <laughs> ways <laughs> um their bourgeoisies need different support, different development. Yeah. Um, their, their sort of the, the nature of their geographical regions are different, kind of thing. Mm. Um, and there, and then also as an extension to that, like, why do so many people, um, so many countries who are, who perhaps over the past hundred years say were subject nations to other geographical country states, uh making the demand for independence mm. um 
in the sort of the current world that you look at in the 20th century and into the 20th century like that is the unit that you need if you want to then start arranging your economic affairs in a way which is sort of self-determined and self-orientated and self-driven yeah. kind of thing um so but there is this conflict to some extent between this sort of like true statement by marx and other marxists to some extent that like um capitalism has this sort of global reach there is this sort of like interconnected economy um there is this desire to break down the barriers of states mm. um all the barriers that are put up by states to some extent but it doesn't seem to be leading per se to the uh erosion of states themselves yeah um and we sort of still seem to be stuck with this with this, this basic unit kind of thing archaic unit but i mean if you look at the ways that the, the, the capitalist class has been able to get past the nation state form right um it almost has kind of come around to work in their favor right if you he brings up the example of multinationals right sure, yeah. corporations using certain countries as bases to exploit in a more like in, in an easier way obviously take some uh, freak company like Apple based in Northern California, which we've discussed at length <laughs> in the past. Not going to go there Neither now. Neither <laughs> of us are fans, but who use um, countries where labor is perhaps cheaper and there are no real regulations on that type of thing to exploit for production for everything that they need to basically make the shit that they make. And then they come back and they, you know, sell that crap to the people in the country where they're based, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's one way in which the nation state helps out capitalists. Sure. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, yeah. And it's a really interesting point that he makes about multinationals that, like, multi the term multinational is quite misleading. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not like the, here is a company that sits above <laughs> the network of states that we have in the that world. That was a really good point. Like, yeah. they're, they are based in a single state and quite often the advancing of the interests of that multinational corporation are a lot the the advancement of those interests is also aligned with the advancing of the interests of the state yeah. or the two work in conjunction with one another um it's not it's not like they have equal footing in multiple different states or like sort of like to some extent, but he he sort of suggests that they don't necessarily have a global shareholdership. Mm. I mean, currently in the modern world, like companies, I suppose, do have sort of like global stakeholders or um, yeah, the, the, their yeah their investors have a sort of global reach. But um, multinational corporations still very much anchored in a very specific country. Um, yeah, not, not multiple. Yeah, I love the way he describes the way capitalists operate as just like, I don't know, and then they make a little bit of money and they go and they fritter it away on Wall Street and swindle other capitalists. And it's just like, what a crappy <laughs> life. What a disgusting, crappy life to live. Um, all right. Well, I suppose we get to the last bit of the chapter now, which is about communism and quote unquote third world countries uh -huh. and about how the state operates there. Obviously, this is dated because this was written in 1977, so he's discussing communist states as they existed. Or, I mean, as they exist, not as they existed in our uh, frame of mind. I said that in a very confusing way. <laughs> he was around when there were actually communist countries. We are not. Um, and yeah, so... Well, the DPI can he? <laughs> his, uh, his analysis is also very rooted in the left uh, drama of his day, which was the kind of like... Chinese communist Maoist view of the state in other communist countries, specifically the Soviet Union, as what they called state capitalism, which was basically a slight to say Stalin, n nothing really happened there. You know, there was all that really was with state capitalism. Mm -hmm. And he, I think as, this is still a live, a live issue. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> but it's like it's one that has no bearing because that that China's not communist and because sure, the Soviet yeah, Union yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. exist. I mean, it's a really good example of of how like. Um, sort of theoretical sort of like historically bounded historically specific theoretical debates divisions between people become um huge schisms yeah, yeah. between between various sects which yeah. which um continue to influence the relationship or the fractured nature of left politics even to the point where the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, yeah. but still sort of like how you categorize the Soviet Union when you think of it as state capitalist or yeah. some other descriptor. Um, 
it's sort of vitally important in whether you can or cannot work with yeah i'm shaking my head group of i'm shaking my other. head for obvious reasons <laughs> um uh, I've never met a Maoist in my entire life, but I've met so many people who have opinions on Maoists and what they think about the Soviet Union. And it's just mm-hmm. like, all right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I feel like um, the state, the the category, the desire or the effort to categorize the Soviet Union as state capitalist, I think of as being something which um, is largely propagated by different uh, Trotskyist theorists. Like mm. Tony Cliff wrote a book, State Capitalism, uh, <laughs> about... Um, how the Soviet Union was state capitalist, the various, there's a, I forget what they're called in the US, or maybe they're a global group, um, uh, the Marxist Humanist uh, Federation? Oh. Marxist Humanist? Anyway, I don't were, know what they're called. Were they in Star Trek? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Any federation. They are called the Ferengi. <laughs> uh, anyway, no. Certain sections, so, certain Marxist Humanist groupings who, uh, are also defendants, descendants of various types of Trotskyist thought, also support the sort of state capitalist theory of yeah. what the Soviet Union was. And to some extent, it's an interesting theoretical debate. Sure. Um, particularly as, I mean, our interest is in transitioning away from capitalism and towards something else, yeah. but overthrowing capitalism. Um, it's important to have a good understanding of how our previous efforts of at that have gone yeah. or gone wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. let's just be communizers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a nice thing to say. I'm yeah. a communizer. Just skip it. <laughs> just skip every. Just go to communism. Just skip the rest. <laughs> I love that. Just have the insurrection. <laughs> just have the damn insurrection already. <laughs> um, yes, and so he also ascribes quite a bit of this book to not ascribes whatever the proper word would be. Um, dedicates a lot of this book to or this chapter to discussing the question of. Did bureaucrats in the Soviet Union represent a class in and of themselves? And he kind of almost does the yes, but thing. He kind of does more of like a but yes, because he's kind of like, <laughs> no, because they, you know, there wasn't like any hereditary like capital to like accumulate and then give to your offspring or something like that. But he makes the point that like, yeah, but these people also had distinct privileges that even though they weren't rooted in capital per se, they're all the bureaucrats you know, might have gotten something a little bit better than the other schmucks who were just working down at the factory or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, he kind of takes a very interesting and like hearty debate and kind of just does an almost frustratingly clear headed analysis by just going, <laughs> well, you know, kind of, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> take a side. <laughs> yeah. I was quite intrigued by this answer to that question, which mm-hmm. he gives, um, which I'd never really come across before. Obviously like just, th- this is, this is the foundation of some arguments about the, that for the Soviet Union being categorized as state capitalist, right? That you you have an exploited class and you have um, a class of bureaucrats who benefit uh, off exploiting the work of others. Um, Miliband takes a position which is, I guess, much more structural, so we say, or he um, he wants to look at the actual nature of um, the sort of social structure of the Soviet Union. Um, and he tries. He does make. He tries to make the argument that, or he clearly believes that um, the the mode of the, the not the mode of production, the means of production in mm. the Soviet Union have been su- successfully collectivized. Um, now they are collectivized under the control of the Soviet state, um, not an organ or apparatus that we are in any way inclined to be supportive of. Yeah. Um, obviously, our socialism, communism would be a democratic and actually sort of like worker directed in a way that the Soviet Union certainly wasn't. Mm. But as you say, he also try he's trying to argue that um, because the 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 sort of party functionaries and bureaucrats weren't actually like owners of the means of production there wasn't any sort of hereditary transition from par- parents to children i suppose mm. um what what you see happening in the soviet union he he argues is quite a natural uh, result of creating a hierarchical system which the soviet union was a strictly hierarchical system sure. where certain benefits passed to people who are higher up that 
quite steep pyramid yeah pyramidal structure of mm-hmm. the the state and the, and also the party which was sort of almost synonymous with the state to some extent um but he's sort of saying that that is happening um despite the collectivized nature of the soviet union not because of it mm. um and i think he's kind of making the case that like if it were possible for those people to have amassed greater fortunes they would have yeah and as i was thinking about this i was thinking well we we can see what um what kinds of fortunes it was possible to amass in the Soviet Union, what became yeah. like the Russian Federation during the nineties, you you see great accumulations of wealth by various oligarchs, um, presumably because it became possible to do that. It was not possible to do that under the Soviet system, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. He almost makes an argument that it's kind of it's almost kind of human nature that uh, certain people might advantage themselves in certain ways if they're given the opportunity to. Um, and I just thought it was quite interesting that, like, yeah, they would, yeah, they were, they were advantages themselves in the sort of bare minimum way that they were able, not yeah, the sort of most maximal possible kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that's us dipping our toe into uh, uh, one of the great debates of socialist modern socialist history. Modern, there's not much else. <laughs> Is to any of it modern? <laughs> yeah. Um, briefly, he talks about states in the third what he calls the third world um and about how the state pretty much in places like haiti and he gives the exa- example of papa dr valier more or less just becomes a way for one family to take power and to enrich themselves and to enrich the peoples around them mm-hmm. um and that makes sense to me but it, and I, I mean it also certainly jives with um one of the reasons that happens is because of the way that the hegemonic states want them to act and they will enrich these people happened in the dominican republic well, I mean, it's basically happened in every country south of the Rio Grande because of America, where um, we want certain, we meaning America, want certain countries to give us certain things, obviously, and it's not fair. So we prop up these families, these people, these dictators to give us those things and allow them to enrich themselves at the expense of their people. Um, this has happened in Guatemala. This has happened in Honduras. This has happened in Argentina, Brazil. Uh, it happened in Cuba, obviously Haiti in one of the most brutal ways. Um and yeah i mean he doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking about it he just kind of gives it like this is how the state operates there and it's another way that the state can exploit um and it seemed yeah i don't know for what he said it it seemed pretty like yeah that makes sense it's very sad but that makes sense it's just a way for one one group of people to enrich themselves over the expense of their country because they kind of see a way out so it sucks yeah it's quite i haven't a great deal to say about it it's an interesting breakdown of um if you're creating a state, what kind of functions do you need it to fulfill? You create a state which meets the needs or the functions of um, the sort of geographical region in which you're creating one kind mm. of thing. Um, he makes an interesting point about the 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 what I, I can't remember what it is, so I'm not going to do it. Something about, <laughs> <laughs> something about there being a that whether the state is set up to. Um, advantage a certain group of people or whether there is a certain people people who which there's a kind of like which comes first kind of situation but yeah i can't yeah (laughs) yeah um if you would like a very sobering understanding of the way that these two power structures meaning like ruling classes and states interact to take advantage of third world countries read a basic history of any country south of america mm-hmm. you'll see exactly how and why specifically guatemala will give you the best example with the fruit company and whatnot um but those are examples where the contradictions between the ruling class and the state come together to form uh, a very amiable between those two at least uh resolution between the contradictions and that those two groups get what they want at the expense of everybody else um milliband <laughs> the number one boy the number one boy um so that was that that was we finally finished defense of the old order too mm-hmm. eventually go and, go and read it yourselves folks because obviously this yourselves. isn't the definitive statement is, yeah. there's so many things said that we have this is an auxiliary covered. statement so, yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah it's just to give you a little sneak peek of what we'll be doing in the future hopefully we'll finish this goddamn book before episode 20 but we might not um next chapter is class and party which will be fun i'm sure i'll have a lot more to say about maoists and that uh, and then reform and revolution. 
and that will be the book. But that's there's a lot to cover in there, so it'll be a couple more episodes. Um, but Miliband, a good person. Um, it's funny if you Google Miliband now. I obviously wasn't out here for this, but was there like 10, 15 years ago? Was there like a big thing where like not even that long? In 2015, really? Maybe, I don't know whether we're talking about the same thing. Maybe Is it like when like tabloids finished. were like. Yeah, so when uh, so when so when Ed, when Ed Miliband was leader of the Labour Party and was uh, running to be prime minister in 2015, sure, there was a lot of there were a, there were there was at least one tabloid headline. It was probably run for more than one story, kind of thing, which was like Ed Miliband's dad hated Britain. <laughs> Who doesn't hate, hate Britain? Britain? <laughs> oh, Jesus, the sympathetic Isle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, good on him. Good on good him. Good on him. Good on him. Uh, they're only mad because they want the British. Only the British are allowed to hate Britain. Yeah, exactly. Like, as much as anybody. Uh, nobody else is allowed to hate Britain quite as much as the British do. <laughs> yeah, from my cursory Google searches, didn't it turn into kind of an anti Semitic thing, too? Oh, I've no doubt. Possibly, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, yeah. not great. Mm. Um, if you're a member of. A bit of anti Semitism, <laughs> a bit of Labour Party. Yeah, exactly. Just mix, mix the dice. If you are were a member of a Jewish Labour Bund, the ruling classes in England probably won't like you. I'm just going to go out there and say that. <laughs> um, that's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, fuck, there was something else I wanted to say. Um, not middle band. Don't remember what it was again. What is happening? Um, Happy New Year, folks. We're in a new year. That's what I'll say. <laughs> We're in a new year. And it's going to be the We're making year. no resolutions. We plan to carry on exactly the same as we have been doing. Exactly. Hopefully yeah, so that's some hope, comfort to all of you. you like it. Uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be a great year. Beans will grow. We'll read some more stuff. And it'll all work itself out. <laughs> Let this whole thing blow <laughs> over. Yeah. <laughs> Everything will come fine in the end. Yeah. Um, anything else to bring up? I don't know. Um, I don't know. Did I see? I saw something that said that Keir Starmer was possibly going to resign. And then he didn't. Oh. So there's that news. For okay. events. <laughs> there was like a rumor because he was making some Kirst sort of announcement. Kirsten resigned. Mm. Yeah, Kirsten Armour, please. And that's by <laughs> Friday he has resigned, in which case Kirsten Armour has resigned. Yeah. Um, look at us breaking news. Look at us breaking news that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. All right, there we go. I wonder what we could convince people had happened. Keir Starmer is I've moved in with Keir Starmer we are uh, living a platonic relationship uh, but is also somehow polyamorous so if you'd like either one of Keir Starmer or I's numbers please let us know folks um, I don't know what music you've been listening to recently Dan introduced me to a band I will say that I have not been able to stop listening to called Cameron Vale so go check them out um, mm. they rock Mm. Awesome. Check them out on Bandcamp. They and put out have... some new stuff recently, oh. relatively recently. So. And they only have like 50 sub, sub, sub listeners on yeah. Spotify or something. So. Yeah, yeah, so Look at me, music hipster that I am. <laughs> um, I don't know. There's a band called Quantic that I got introduced to recently that kind of blew my mind a little bit. <laughs> um, but that was Is that cool. what was blowing your mind? <laughs> that blew my mind. Um... <laughs> I don't know. What else? King Gizzard put out a new album and I didn't even realize it was a collection of... Oh! King Gizzard put out... Uh, a we'll new album. Was a they put out several new albums that I didn't realize. But one of the albums they put out was a collection... Not a collection. It was a live recording from a show that I was at in London. Oh, nice. It's awesome. Because I had to leave early to get the train. So I was like, oh, I'll listen to the last song. It was good. So that's that. <laughs> so now you know what you missed out on. Exactly. Now you know yeah, what you yeah. missed out on. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I've been I've been listening to 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 the Tuareg music again. Ah. I've been listening to Imahan. I've been listening cool. to um, Tanaraen Tanara a little Tanara. bit. There's a lot. Yeah, another band from Mali came up on my Spotify. I forget their name. So, something blues. Song Hey Blues. I oh think. yeah, Song High Blues. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is going on with the music coming out of Mali? <laughs> it rocks, dude. I love it. Specifically, one part of Mali. It's really, mm -hmm. really good. Mm -hmm. Check it out folks um yeah i don't know yeah 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 good stuff music good folks yeah. music good listen I'll to have more better. i'll do better next time with my <laughs> music offering I hit, I hit you with it kind of uh all of a sudden yeah, there's yeah. no real no real prep for that yeah. um join us next week when we discuss <laughs> our spotify roundups of 2020 <laughs> my spotify roundup was almost entirely king gizzard i'll just say that right now yeah yeah, yeah were yeah. you in anyone's top listeners um, 
I don't know what that means. I will listen. To, there's, 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 um, there's a band called Melt Yourself Down. Wow. Yeah, I'm a big fan of. Cool. They've got an album at the beginning of the year, mm. um, and I think it, I think it must have done quite well. Um, and so it gave me some kind of st- stat, like I was in the zero point zero one percent of people nice. who listened to it the first uh, in a certain first period of time, kind of thing. Mm. So uh, it designated me some kind of trailblazer for that. Nice. It would not be. It's not surprising that like. That was my most listened album, and four out of my top five, yeah. the top of the top five songs, the top four were yeah. all from that album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I don't know. I good don't stuff. Know. Comet is coming. This is really late. Put out some. Oh, is that album out? Do you know? I don't think so. No, there was a single at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good single. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah different to kind of some of their other stuff, but good. Um, I am a fan of anything Shabaka does. Quite frankly, all of his bands are so good. Um, been listening to a lot. A lot of sons of Kemet, but I've also been getting into um, Ancestors. Ancestors yeah, Shabaka rock, Ancestors. dude. It's so yeah, good. Um, yeah. Shabaka, check him out. Very, very cool. Shabaka, come on the pod. Um, and yeah, that's about it. I don't know anything else. Listen to Shabaka Hutchings. Listen to Comet is Coming. Listen to Melt Yourself Down. <laughs> Listen to Cameron Vale. And that is about it. Dance better. Dance better. <laughs> Dance better. We'll leave it at that. Um, welcome to Auxiliary Statements. <laughs> My name is Jack. My name is John. Um, thank you for listening. This has been Auxiliary <laughs> Statements. My name is Jack. My name is Phil. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs>